Hey guys, thanks for joining me for another episode of Learn to Play Games. My name is Lance, and today we're going to take a look at Aeon's End. This is a brand new game by Action Phase Games. It is a one to four player fully cooperative deck builder. And it takes roughly an hour to two hours to play, depending upon the skill level of the players and the number of players you're playing with. So the backstory to this is that the world has been taken over by these various monsters and nemesis and all that, and if they've pretty much destroyed most of the world, except for this one last beacon of hope, which is called Gravehold. And so over time, these mages have learned to use the breaches against the monsters, and, it, and they're ready to go out and fight them at this point and try to take back our worlds. So that's where we come in. We get to choose one or more of these breach mages to play in the game against the nemesis of that whatever one you choose. And there are a couple that are included in the, in the core set, so you have a couple of choices, and there are expansions already that are available that will add additional breach mages as well as nemesises to your game. So just like regular deck builders, this one works uh, similarly where you'll have gem cards that will give you ether, which will allow you to purchase additional cards from the market. Then you have relic cards, which will give you instant effects when you play them, uh, various types. And then finally, there are spell cards, which you'll be able to cast onto your open breaches. And the following turn, you'll be able to uh, actually cast those to do either damage to the nemesis or his minions or other effects. So from there, then you're working against the, uh, the nemesis to try to defeat him or meet other conditions before either the players are exhausted or Gravehold has been destroyed. So my opinions of the game so far, first off, uh, the positives. I, I enjoy the game as a deck builder. I think they did a, a really good job with the playtesting. It seems very balanced to me uh, that you really have to work very hard. Uh, to, to win the game, and uh, I don't believe the pressure is so high that it, it makes you feel exhausted when you're done. Uh, the couple games that I've played, the ones that I've lost, I, I want to get right back into it, I want to give it another go, I feel like I just missed uh, winning it, so it definitely draws you back for more, um, and the way that they, the Nemesis is set up, as you guys will see in the video, uh, he has new things each time he comes into the field, so even if you've played the same one a couple times, uh, he's still going to have surprises for you. He's still going to to make you really work to get uh, a victory out of him. So I really enjoy that. I, I think, like I said, they did a really good job with the balancing of the game. Um, and I like the way that everything flows. I like the cooperative aspect to it, that you're not competing against each other to achieve these things, that you're actually working together. And it does really make a difference. You really do need to work as a team. Uh, using each of the Breach Mage's strengths and trying to know what their weaknesses are so that you can compensate for those as well. So the only drawbacks that I've seen so far mainly are cosmetic. Uh, Action Phase does turn out a great game. Don't let, don't let me say anything about that. The only thing I had issues with are some of the components that they, they chose to go with, um, especially the way that they packaged the box. Uh, I Even the copy that I got... Uh, from the Kickstarter had some issues with it. it there was a couple of things that were damaged in it. Um, so I would have really liked to see that they had some sort of an organizer in there or uh, something to keep the, the components safe. On top of that, I would have liked to see um, some of the components uh, upgraded just a little bit more. Like the breaches are on regular card. It would have been nice to see those as uh, cardboard tokens or some other uh, method of using those. And... I would have liked to see some, some higher grade upgrades on some of the components. Other than that, the game itself is great. The artwork was very well done. Uh, everything looks really nice and polished. And like I said, the, the gameplay itself is, is, is a great game. So I would definitely recommend it if you like deck builders, if you're into those kind of games, or you just like fantasy games where you're working together or cooperative games, uh, definitely give this one a chance. Uh, take a look at it. Um, they really did put a lot of work into it, and I would definitely recommend checking it out. So let's head to the table, and I'll teach you guys how to play. So there are three different types of cards the players are going to be working with. The spell cards, which have the yellow background, the relic cards, which have a blue background, and the gem cards, which have a purple background. Each of these cards is going to have some different pieces of information on it, in the top corner of the card, if you're purchasing it from the market, will have its ether cost. Then you're going to have the card's name, along with what type of card it is, 
and any effects that that card has, along with any flavor text at the bottom. On top of that, you're also going to have an S in the bottom corner for any cards that are starter cards for the particular players. So going along the cards, each card has different ways that it'll work. For spell cards, normally you have to attach them to an open breach, and they will be cast the following turn. There are certain things that you can do to cast them earlier, but we'll cover those in the game. With relic cards, normally when you use them, their effect is done immediately. When they're resolved, then they'll be put into the discard pile. And finally, the gem cards will provide you with a certain number of ether, and some of them will also have different effects. Each player will have four different breaches, one of each breach number, so one, two, three, and four. And on each breach, there's going to be different pieces of information. So the level one breach is, is the same on both sides and is always open, so that will be the same. For two, three, and four breaches, you have different pieces of information. Each one has four different sectors for opening, and the top sector is always the one you're going to refer to. And it's going to list the cost in Ether to open it. So, for example, with the breach two, to open this one right away would cost us four Ether. On, from there, then you have this blue circle that goes around each one, which has a focus cost in Ether, and again, you'd reference this top section. So in order to focus this one, it would cost us two Ether, and then it shows the, the way we rotate it 90 degrees. So if we focus, then we'll rotate it 90, and this would become the new result. And as you can see, the cost to open it then is reduced until you finally get to its section here, which is the very cheapest way to open it. On top of that, breaches three and four, once opened, will also have an effect where they can do one additional damage on a cast. And you can open your breaches or focus them in any order that you choose. So, for example, if you have, when you start the game with breach one opened, but you can choose to work on breach four or three way before you open up breach two. So each nemesis card is going to list the name of the nemesis that you're facing, the number of hit points that he has, and then he has a couple of different categories. So here we have the rules for his Unleash ability. If you want to increase the difficulty, then you'll use the rules here. If not, then you can just ignore this section altogether. And then this section will also list additional rules that the particular nemesis has. Now on the back of the card, it's going to have some flavor text to give you a little bit more backstory about that particular nemesis, and then any special instructions for setup for that particular nemesis. The Nemesis deck is comprised of three different types of cards, which are easily identified by the color of the card. So the first one we have are the Minion cards, which have the blue teal background to them, the Attack cards, which have a purple background, and the Power cards, which have a yellow background. On top of that, each one of these cards is going to have different pieces of information on it. First off, the name and the type of uh, card it is, and then the abilities of the card that are listed in the middle, along with flavor text at the bottom, and then what deck it's from. There is a basic deck, and then there are specific decks for the various nemesises. And then in the corner here, we also have a number, which lists the level of that card, which in this game, most of the time, you're going to be using levels 1, 2, and 3. So let's go ahead and take a look at the breakdown of some of these cards a little bit more. So the first time a uh, minion card comes up, you're going to put a number of hit points in there listed by his hit points that he has. So he has six, and then his effects when he gets activated the next time. For attack cards, you will resolve their effects immediately and follow all the instructions on the card to the best of your ability. And then finally, we have power cards, which when they're placed, if they list the power level, then you'll place that number of power tokens on there. Some of the power cards are also going to have a two discard effect, which the players can do up until the point when the card is activated during the player's turns. If they don't do that, then the power, when all of the power tokens are removed, which one power token will be removed each time the nemesis is activated, when all the power tokens are removed, then you will simply follow the steps that are listed on the card. At the beginning of the game, each player is going to choose a mage or mages to play. Once they have, then they can go ahead and grab the mages dashboard and set up their breaches as they're shown. So our first level breach is always open. 
Then our mage here starts with a second level breach open. Her third level breach will be positions like this with the color side facing in this direction. And the fourth level breach will have their section pointed down. From there, I like to have the power nodes right underneath the card for the mage that we're using. So this one has four. And then each mage will start with 10 life. You can assign or randomly assign a mage a player number. And then they can also have a reference card. From there, then, you can go ahead and gather the mage's starting hands. So our mage has the moon shard, two crystals, and two sparks for their starting hands. So this one will stay in their hand. And then for their starting deck, they have three crystals and two sparks. And this is the order that they'll be played in. So the crystals can be done first, and the sparks will go on top of them. That way, when you turn it over, the crystals will come up first. And then we'll place that over here. Constructing the turn order deck is very easy. So you're always going to have two Nemesis cards included in the turn order deck. So you can set those off to the side. And then, depending upon the number of mages that you're using, will be the number of cards that you're going to include in those different types. So as you guys can see, there are two player one and two player two. So if you're playing with two mages, then you would include all four of those, as you will always have four player cards in the turn order deck. If you're playing with a three player game, then you'll have one player one, one player two, one player three, and the wild card. And a four player game will have one, two, three, and four. As we're playing with a two player game, we'll include our two nemesis cards, the two player two cards, and the two player one cards. From here, you would just shuffle up the deck, and you have your turn order deck. To construct a Nemesis deck, the first thing you're going to do is grab the nine cards that are specific to the Nemesis that you're using. So we're doing Rageborn, so we have his deck here. And then you're going to go ahead and break it into the three different levels. So we have level one, level two, and level three. From there, you're going to do the same with the basic cards, breaking them into levels one, two, and three. And then you're going to consult the chart that you guys can see up here in the top corner. Based on the number of players, then you're going to go ahead and shuffle up those basic cards and randomly draw out a number of cards. So for we're going to go ahead and play a two-player game. So we're going to have three level one cards. So one, two, and three. The rest of the cards will go off to the side and won't be used this game. For level two, we're going to have five cards. And finally, for level three, we're going to have seven. From here, then you're going to go ahead and shuffle up each deck individually. Once the decks are good and shuffled, then you're going to stack them with level three on the bottom, level two on top of that, and level one on top of that. From here, you will not shuffle that deck again. For the Nemesis setup, the first thing we're going to do is flip over his card and check the setup instructions. So it says shuffle all the strike cards together and place them face down to form the strike deck. And then the Rageborn is going to gain one Fury token. So we're going to go ahead and grab the strike deck and go ahead and shuffle it up. And it has a total of six cards in it. Then we'll place that on its side. Then we can go ahead and grab the Fury tokens and provide one to his card to start. I would also put out the power tokens as you'll use those for some of his cards later. And you can go ahead and put out the Nemesis deck that we've already constructed. And then finally, the Nemesis, we have to set his hit points. So the Nemesis will start with 70 hit points, so we'll put 70 on his gauge, and we're ready to start with him. There are a number of different ways that you can create the market deck. In the game, there are three different cards that are double-faced that give you some different ways and guidelines to set up the market deck. You can also always just choose which cards you would like to include in your market deck, or they also have cards that have the gray-backed borders, which are randomizer cards, which at the beginning of the game you can shuffle these up for each separate section. So for gems, I could shuffle these up and then randomly just draw a couple of them to determine which gems I will have in this game. On top of that, the book itself does come with a couple of basic setups for beginners. And then we're going to go ahead and use the one that is the recommended one for the very beginning game. So we have our three gem cards. 
our two relic cards. And finally, our four spell cards. Each one of these stacks is made up of a number of the same card. When a stack runs out, you will not replace that stack. It is simply used up for the game. Then you can go ahead and set out the Nemesis board and do all the stuff that we already talked about for his setup. And then finally, you can go ahead and place out the player boards. The last thing you'll do before you're ready to start the game is to set your grave hold marker to 30, which is the number of points that your town will have. And if at any point in time that reaches zero, then you have lost the game. Aeon's End is played over a number of turns, with each turn activating both the players and the nemesis in a random order that'll be determined by the turn order deck. So to start the turn, the first thing you're going to do is flip over the top card, and that will tell you what is activated. So in this situation, we're going to activate player one, so player one will get to take his turn. During a player's turn, it's going to consist of three phases, casting, main, and draw phase, which we're going to take a closer look at each one of these in depth. The first phase in a player's turn is the casting phase. During this phase, you you can cast any spells that are prepped to an open breach. You don't have to cast the spells if you don't want to though. Then each spell that is prepped to a closed breach, which you had focused the previous turn, must be cast now. You can choose the order of which the spells are cast. To cast a spell, you're going to discard it from the open breach to the discard pile and then resolve its effects. Spells, unless specified, are only going to build a target one target, whether it's a the nemesis himself or one of his minions. And some open breaches will add a effect when cast, so like when we had the third and fourth breach, if those were open, they would add plus one damage to a spell. Moving into a player's main phase, a player has a choice of eight different actions they can perform, which can be done in any order and any number of times. The first action that a player can do is to play a gem or relic card, perform all the text on the card, gain any ether that the card provides, and then if there is any unused ether at the end of the turn, it is going to be lost. And at the end of the turn, you're going to discard all of your gem and relic cards that you use this turn into that player's discard pile. You can gain a card by purchasing a card from the supply, the market supply, with using any of the ether that you gained this turn. You're going to place it on top of your discard pile after you've done that. You can also pay two ether to gain a charge for your player. You are not allowed to purchase charges for other players. You can also spend your ether to focus a breach by turning it 90 degrees and paying its cost. Once you've focused a breach, you can prep a spell to it if you have a spell to prep to it this turn. And you can focus a breach any number of times during your turn by paying its cost. You can also open a breach by paying its open cost and turning it face up. And then you can also choose to prep a spell to it. You can prep a spell to a breach. So you would play a spell card onto an open breach or a breach that has been focused this turn. Only one spell can be prepped to a breach at a time. Prep spells can also ca be cast during the casting phase of that player's next turn. You can also choose to resolve a wild prepped effect, which some of the spells, as you guys can see here, the wildfire whip, it says while prepped, you may spend two ether during your main phase to cast any player's prepped spell. You can also do this on the same turn that a spell is prepped that provides that effect. And then last, you can resolve to discard effect. Some nemesis power cards have a, a discard effect, and you may fully resolve the effect listed on the discard to discard that power card. If a power card is discarded in this way, then the effect is not resolved. So some of the Nemesis cards are going to have the power tokens on them, and as long as there's a power token on them, then a player, some of the times, the card will have an effect that the player can neutralize, and then the card is simply discarded without resolving it. So let's go ahead and take a look at how this works. So our player, player one, is going to take their turn. They don't have any spells to cast, so then they're going to move into their main phase. They have two spells that are in their hands, 
two regular crystals and a moon star, a moonstone shard. So they're going to go ahead and prep these two spells. So they're open breaches. And then they're going to go ahead and spend their crystals. So they have each one of these crystals provides one ether. And this one provides one ether and you can gain an additional ether, which can only be used to gain a gem. So let's go ahead and spend these four ether to go ahead and gain one of these diamond crystals, which we'll place in our discard pile. And then the rest of the gems that we've used this turn will also be placed in the discard pile in any order that we choose. So let's go ahead and do that. The last phase in a player's turn is the draw phase. During this phase, you're going to draw back up to five cards in your hand from your draw pile. If you've already had cards in your hand from the main phase, then you're going to go ahead and just draw the number of cards you need. So our player has used all of her cards, so she'll go ahead and draw five cards. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, and those are added to her hands. When, you draw, when your draw pile is empty, without shuffling, flip over your discard pile to make a new draw deck. So our draw deck is empty, so we're going to go ahead and just flip over our discard pile and add it to our draw pile. You cannot choose to discard cards from your hands. You can look through the discard pile, but you are not allowed to look through the draw pile and you have no maximum hand size. So there are different effects that will allow you to draw additional cards, but you don't want to do those until after your draw phase because like you just saw, you can only draw up to five cards in your hand, and if you had cards in your hand beforehand, then you could only draw additional cards up to that five card limit. Now that we've completed the first player's turn, we're gonna go ahead and turn over the next card in the turn order deck to see who goes next. All right, so we have player two, so we'll go ahead and take a look at player two's turn. So first again, we'll cast any spells that we have in our breaches, which we don't have any right now. So then we can go and move into our main phase. So we have Amethyst Shard, which gives us one ether, and any ally may draw a card and then discard a card. And then we have two crystals and two sparks. So our player is gonna go ahead and put the one spark in there and then he's going to go ahead, let's go ahead and spend two to focus this, this breach here. So we'll turn that. And now that we've focused the breach, we can put a, uh, prep a spell onto it. And then this particular one gives us one additional ether, but we don't have anything to use for it. So we're just going to go ahead and hold on to this card for this turn. So our two gems, our two crystals will go into our discard pile, and then we'll draw back up. So we're only gonna draw four cards as we still have that one card in our hand. And then our player's turn is over. All right, so let's see who goes next in the turn order. All right, so now we're gonna take a look at the Nemesis's turn. So during a Nemesis turn, it's broken into two phases, the main phase and the draw phase. The first phase in a Nemesis turn is the main phase. Starting with the minion or power card that has been in play the longest, the players will resolve the effects of each minion card and power card in play. Persistent effects are resolved now, and each power card in play will lose one power token. After removing the token, if the power card has no tokens left on it, you're going to resolve the effects as shown after the power X sign, and discard it from play. So let's go ahead and say, for example, that we had a minion played during the... the uh, Nemesis's first activation, and this power card played after that. So during this particular activation, we're going to go ahead and resolve the effects of each card, starting with the oldest card and working our way to the newest one. So first off with the minion, we would resolve its persistent effect, which is an unleash. So if we come up here to our Nemesis, an unleashed effect says that Rageborn gains one Fury token, so we would add one Fury token to him, and then there's no other effects on there, so we move over to the next card. It is a power card, and it still has power tokens on it, so we would simply remove one of those power tokens. If, for example, it had no power tokens left on it, then you would resolve the effect that is listed on the card. Moving into the draw phase, we're going to go ahead and draw a card from the Nemesis deck. If it is an attack card, then we're going to resolve it immediately, so we have an attack card here. So it says that the players collectively discard four cards. So the players are going to go ahead and choose cards from their hands to discard. So let's see what we got. So our 
one player is going to go ahead and discard two crystals. And our other player over there will do the same with two of their cards. Then this card will be discarded to the discard pile. If it is a minion or power card, you're going to put it into play with the appropriate number of life or power tokens. So as we saw earlier, if we would have drawn, say, a minion card instead, we would have put the life on it or the power card into play. Then we would put the number of power tokens on it that is listed. So this one has three. You're going to resolve any effects that happen immediately. So like our attack was an immediate effect. The rest of the effects will not be resolved this turn. When resolving a card's effects, you're going to resolve as much as possible. If you are given a choice between two effects, you must choose an option you can fully resolve. Persistent and power effects will only occur during the Nemesis's main phase, so these effects are ignored for a newly placed card, minion and power cards, until the Nemesis's next turn. So, like we said, we would not be removing power tokens this turn, and we would not resolve the, the minion's persistent effect as it is, was the turn that we played it. If a player's life is ever reduced to zero health, that player is exhausted. Resolve effects in order. You're going to resolve the Nemesis's Unleash effect twice. The exhausted player destroys one of their breaches and discards any spells prepped to it. Then the player is going to discard all of their charge tokens from that player. The exhausted players cannot gain life. When a card deals damage to a player with the lowest life, it's always going to target a non-exhausted player with the lowest current health. When an exhausted player suffers damage, instead deal twice that amount of damage to Grave Hold. And if all players become exhausted, the game is over. So let's go ahead and take a look at an example of this. Let's go ahead and say that our mage here had taken two more damage from some effect. The first thing we're going to do is resolve the Nemesis's Unleash effect twice, so it says Rageborn gains one Fury token, so we'll add two tokens to him. From there, then we have to choose one of our breaches to destroy. We can choose either one of the open ones or the closed one over here, but as both of these grant a bonus damage when they're open, let's go ahead and destroy one of these instead. So we'll remove the breach, and any spell that is prepped to it will be discarded to the discard pile. And then from there, then finally, we're going to discard any of the charges that we have currently on our player board. In all situations, when an end game condition is met, the gameplay ends immediately with no further resolution of effects. So the players are going to be victorious if any of the following conditions are true. The Nemesis has no cards in its deck, which is the Nemesis's deck, and there are no minions or power cards in play or if the nemesis has zero life left on its life counter. The players are going to lose if any of the following conditions are true. If all players are exhausted and have no life, or if grave hold is reduced to zero health. In addition, some nemesis may have specific victory conditions listed on their nemesis mat that causes the players to lose immediately. So let's go ahead and see how the rest of the turn plays out. So we'll flip with the turn order card, and it's going to be player two that will go next. So first we're going to do our casting. So we have two spells that are prepped, and we're going to go ahead and use both of those. So they're going to deal one damage apiece, and the only thing that's out there right now is the nemesis. So we'll two do damage to him, so we'll reduce his damage down to 68. From there, then our, our we're going to go ahead and minute, head into our main phase. So our wizard only has three cards this turn because of the nemesis effect. And he has two crystals and his amethyst shard. So he's going to go ahead and use the amethyst shard to allow an ally to draw a card and then to discard a card. So our ally over here is going to go ahead and discard one of his uh, gems. And that will allow him to draw another card which is his diamond cluster. From there, then, we have two gems left, plus the one that was given to us from that card. But we're just going to go ahead and grab a jade. So we'll place the jade in our discard, and then the two gems on top. From there, then, we'll go ahead and draw back up. So we have one card here, and then our discard will be turned over, and we'll draw four more. Moving on, we have... 
the nemesis for their second term. So again, we're going to resolve any effects starting from the, the oldest to the newest, which we don't have any right now. So then we're going to go ahead and flip over the next card in the stack. So we have a minion, so it has five health. So we're going to go ahead and put five health tokens on there. And then he, we cannot resolve any of his effects because then we would go in, we've already done into the draw phase. So we won't resolve that this turn. And so then we'll go to the next player to see what uh, we have next. So player one. So player one will come back over and resolve their turn. So first we're going to go ahead and cast some spells. And now we have a choice. We can either go after the Rageborn or the minion. So let's go ahead and do two damage to the minion. Then we're going to go ahead and look at our cards and see what we can do. So we have two more spells. So let's go ahead and prep them into breaches one and two. And this one shouldn't be open yet. And then this one right here, this diamond crystal gives us two ether. So we're going to go ahead, let's go ahead and buy another gem. Then that will go to our discard, and we'll draw five new cards. We're out of cards, so we'll flip over our discard pile and add two more cards to it. And that is the end of our turn. So at this point, then we would shuffle up the turn order deck and start a new turn. Well, I hope that gave you guys a good idea of how the game runs. As always, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comment section below, and I'll do my best to answer them. And if you like what I do, if you enjoy watching these videos and you think I do a good job, please consider hitting that like button and subscribing to my channel, as it really does make a difference. It really helps me to stay focused and, and uh, motivated to do more of these videos, and it also really helps when I go to companies to try to get uh, support for my channel, so that I can provide you guys with all the awesome new games that are coming out. So, as always, thank you guys very much for watching. I do really appreciate uh, you guys taking the time to watch my videos, to comment on my videos, and let me know what I'm doing. Uh, please also, you know, consider letting me know what you guys are interested in. If there's certain games you want me to cover, please leave those in the comment section below. And let me know how your game sessions are going, what you guys are playing, what you're excited about, or uh, what you would really like to see covered. Uh, and until next time, thanks again for watching. I'll see you guys.